Cool. All right, Wolf, I'm going to throw presenter over to you, and then you and Alk can do your postmortem. Awesome. Is it showing the right screen? Is it okay, the... I see a picture on the left. I see... No, it's not. The right with Google, whatever. All right, let me see how to change that. You fix it by fixing it. Um, uh, is that it? That's nah, Twitter. That's Twitter. Okay. I have four monitors, so I, I'll find out which one it is. Not That's that okay. one. Oh, is it? Google's Google? knocking <laughs> I... I'm so upset. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> monitors. Oh, well, right, well, so this is my problem. main monitor, but it's not showing the uh, PowerPoint, is what you guys are saying? Yeah, it might not, the presentation mode, it might not be like, it's figuring out how to grab the right, right layer when you have it going. Let me see if I do just a window. We um, could always have it switch to mine, um, I guess. How about that? Okay, <laughs> one second while I pump, pop it over to Alk and make presenter, see if that works. Okay. Do you see it? I see watercress logo. Can you see my mouse moving around, or is that a yeah, is that I see the mouse? Thing? Okay, good enough. All right, it's all yours then. Awesome. So today our talk is about our first venture into commercial games, uh, entitled One Step Forward, and our postmortem on uh, how we had to shelve the project after two years. It is the project is dead. Yes, it is, dead. and we have killed it. <laughs> So our talk is hosted by myself. I am known as Wolf Online, and I am the studio director and uh, one of the writing directors over at Watercress. And I'm Al. Al yeah, I'm the finance director, uh, marketing director, and cinematics director, among some other things. Yeah, so Watercress some background on us as a studio. We've been around since 2014, and we've released over 10 games with uh, a couple of publishing deals with uh, some of our friendly studios. And we've released four on Steam, which are the ones listed there. Uh, we've been volunteer since we started back in 2014, and we are a rather large studio with over 40 volunteers. And we are attempting to transition from volunteer to commercial and you will see why that is hard in the rest of this talk. So our overview, we'll talk about the concept of the game One Step Forward. We will go into details of a micro of the project, um, how we planned the project, the actual transitioning for, uh, to commercial development, and we'll talk about finances behind it and the finances of a freeware studio. And then finally, the legal aspect of making a commercial game. So for the micro, the project foundations, it started back in, I believe it was 2017, with the idea of characters themed after citrus fruit. And that was the single idea behind the game. As you can see, the character on the left is modeled after an orange, and the character on the right is modeled after a lemon with their hair color. Uh, very quickly, we began to realize the faults in our concepting and why basing our entire game off of one small meme concept and not expanding on it larger caused some issues. We ended up having to rework the project from a classic high school slice of life game all the way to a uh, millennial depression simulator. <laughs> so, um, and one of the issues that we encountered in this long, <laughs> this, this long dev time of over two years is that ultimately a, a studio that is freeware will have more turnover than a studio that is commercial since people are here for the passion and not for money. So, the turnover of the project was much higher than we expected, and we weren't equipped to replace important members that had left. Uh, in fact, the director team for assets uh, at the end of the project was completely different from at the beginning. 
So having turnover in leadership definitely damaged the project and caused us to have to reteach some people partway through the uh, game and have to reevaluate how we did our sprites. As you can see, the two sprites in screen are very different. The artist for the sprite in the left left the project partway through. So we had to very quickly create some mockups, at least to use an engine, while we reconsidered how we wanted to do art for the game. And ultimately, our decision to band-aid the art for the game was to split up the tasking for the artists. You know, one artist will do concept, one will do line art, and another will do coloring. Um, which meant that we had to use more people just to create the art, when normally we would just have one or two people working on uh, large parts of the game. And ultimately, deadlines also damage the studio. Uh, with a freeware studio, deadlines aren't really through contracting, because you can't contract someone when you're a volunteer. Um, you can contact them through NDAs, as we did, but expecting people to work under really strict deadlines while they don't earn money from the project and they have to, you know, have the full-time jobs and university and stuff like that meant that deadlines were often missed and it uh, slowed down the project. Normally, a game of this size, roughly 60,000 words, we could do in a month previously, but due to the problems inherent with the concept and how we went about the concept caused it to balloon and the deadlines were missed more and more as we continued on. So for the macro of the project, the scope and scale were actually not as much of an issue. We didn't really have feature creep with a relatively slice of life game, but the re reworks of the concept in order to fit the new members of the team and to make a game that people enjoyed ended up causing a lot of fatigue in the studio. While we were reworking the project from things that we didn't initially like, it meant that not everyone would ultimately be happy with the reworks. And with a relatively fluid writing team, it meant that we had to rewrite large portions of the game. Um, alongside this, Watercrest being such a large studio, we don't work on one project at once. We often have several we're working on. Um, and at the time, we were working on mobile ports and revamping our website and Nano Reno coming every year. And we did Yuri Jam as well. Um, ultimately, parallel development for us would work if we had the initial director team for our assets. Also, Al, you changed what is currently on screen. Oh, shit. I thought I fixed that. <laughs> um, so, so while we would have previously been able to handle parallel development, losing strong members of the studio, our writing director, our lead artist, um, and I had to cover for uh, music for a while, meant that um, we just couldn't handle all the projects we previously had. And we ultimately didn't transfer over our uh, mindset on development in order to accommodate for these changes in the team. Uh, we continued to do the parallel development, even though we ultimately didn't have the manpower to do so. Uh, and this is where the sunk cost fallacy comes into play. When we have so many projects we're working on um, that we have to upkeep, especially like the website, uh, we don't want to stop any of them. But ultimately, you have to make the decision. You have to kill your darlings. Some things have to go and we didn't in time make that decision. Another thing I wanna talk about is the studio culture. Uh, our unofficial motto is life comes first. So Watercrest very much is dedicated to letting people take breaks, people go on hiatus if they want. Um, we're volunteers, so we're not you know, chaining you to the project. If you have to go, you have to go. And while that is a good mindset to have, for a freeware studio, ultimately, if a game is eventually going to be commercial, you're going to kickstart it and you're going to back pay people for the work they all did, we can't have a team as fluid as that. 
you need to ensure that each team has people who will be there from beginning to end. So you're not constantly revising and reworking your, your product. And as a studio that has released 10 plus games for game jams, we are relatively inexperienced at working outside of game jams. So having a project that isn't um, do or die due at April 1st or due December 1st or whenever meant that we were a lot more lax in the way we did things. Um, <laughs> the game. Uh, fuck, sorry. Um, so we were, we were unprepared to deal with a longer dev period. We are very, very good at working under uh, solid stress and crunch. And as good or bad as that is, it means that if we don't have a guaranteed crunch, we will run into issues. Uh, and we will get into the ways to solve that uh, later on in this talk. And we have people swearing in the background. Oh, do we? Here you go ahead. Yeah. We will talk about crunch briefly slash not briefly later. So we'll go ahead. Okay. So when we, in, ter in terms of paying people and then transitioning to a commercial studio, uh, there's a lot of individual parts that go into it. It's actually very complicated. Um, when we started Citrus a couple of years ago, we actually had not done anything. We hadn't incorporated. We hadn't launched any significant services. We were just looking into the idea of getting paid. Um, and we, we managed actually pretty well. Uh, we went through the whole bunch of processes, which I'll detail in the next slide. But we ended up having a difficult time because there are expenses that go along with making a studio. Uh, you know, we, ha we have the taxes, which happen every year, but also happen whenever you sell physical merch uh, across state or international borders. Um, payroll, depending on the structure of your studio, and then fees for putting games on to places, whether it be Steam, uh, Itch doesn't have fees, obviously, but some of the places do. Um, so you have to you have to budget that into your overall consideration to how much is the game going to cost ahead of time, and can you do that feasibly? You know, we have and in order to determine who gets paid what, we have to understand from the outset what the scope of the project is, what are people getting paid for, are they participating in the project actively, or are they, you know, are they kind of contributing here on the side just to kind of show up and get a paycheck at the end, uh, which is difficult to judge, but it's unfair to the project members who are, who are working to just kind of give everybody the same sort of treatment. Um, we also have to consider, well, how do we cover the holes on the team that exist? You know, our art team is missing a background artist. We don't have someone who actually makes background art at all. Uh, so we did eventually look into contracting, and that's, that is an expensive proposition. Uh, even at the low end, a hundred dollars for uh, a background is pretty expensive. Um, and then when we look at paying our own members, how do we determine lump sum versus royalties? So, for the for our case, royalties wasn't feasible because we it requires an overhead paying people consistently every month or every year, every time we get an increase in sales means that we need basically a dedicated, a dedicated accounting apartment, which we don't have. Um, it's me and I'm not a certified CPA, certified, certified public accountant. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> um, but lump sum makes it easier, but it also doesn't mean, or it also means that you may not necessarily get the greatest amount of money that you're, 
your work would otherwise be worth. And so we wouldn't want, we, we don't want to underpay people, but at the same time, realistically, nobody is getting paid until everybody gets paid. Because uh, even we who own the studio don't actually get paid anything. Uh, and then there's lawyers. Lawyers are horrendously expensive. And with that, we get into the legal side of it. So we broached it a little bit earlier. Um, we have NDAs and contracts that we need to consider uh, because we need to guarantee that people aren't going to talk about the project, which is not so much a problem at our level, but it's a good practice to get into. So, you know, getting NDAs written and established is a great way for us to get further along into that space. We get practice and we also had the opportunity to just put the NDAs out there and have them established so we don't have to remake them in the future. Contracts are a little bit different though. There is a there is a fee to making a contract. Um, so in our case, we actually ended up using Rocket Lawyer for NDAs and some of the base contracts, but having a proper contract looked over by an actual lawyer that's who's sitting in, right in front of you is actually invaluable. There's a lot of things that are going to be missed that are probably particular to your situation that are really important for a lawyer to get at. And in doing so and trying to understand what kind of contracts we're going to be making, um, or in order to do that, we need to have a solid plan of what the game looks like and what how we're trying to execute. And so the environment of Citrus, or one step forward, was very much against the idea of planning. Uh, you know, when we had to look into trademarking the title and the studio logo and the name and all that, we were actually, we were actively discussing whether or not we wanted that to be the title of the game in the first place, which made it very difficult to even consider putting forth the expense, considering it costs about $400 to do so, uh, reasonably priced. And then there's also the issue of when we decide to get people to produce work for Watercress, are they going to be independent contractors or are they going to be employees? Uh, so I'm not sure how it is in the rest of the world, but at least in the United States, uh, an employee gets full-time benefits usually. You get paid regularly for the hours you work. You get paid and you get benefits, including health insurance and a whole bunch of other stuff. And that's a cost that we can't really afford to incur. Um, and that also includes the payroll, uh, all sorts of other stuff. Independent contractors are a great idea. And we, you know, if we have a contract that says you're going to do X, Y, and Z, that's good in concept. But the legal environment around that is always changing. Uh, recently in California, they actually just passed a bill that changes how independent contractors are defined. And that has an effect on how we ask people to do work and what kind of work we can ask people to do while getting paid if they're living in California. And this is, I, I have to probably say that this is not legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, you should talk to a lawyer if you've got significant questions about expanding and making money and all that. But there, there are reasonable concerns that you need to look into before you start expanding. And then we go into Kickstarter. Uh, one of the ways we were looking to finance the game was Kickstarter. Uh, but part of the problem is that Kickstarter requires, a, it requires a 90 day lead time, uh, and at least in our estimation, it requires 90 days in order to, to effectively make a Kickstarter work. So from inception to launch, you know, you need to make people aware that a Kickstarter is going to happen. You also need to produce assets. You need to know what your game is actually going to be. And in many cases, most people have a working demo of their game to present to people when they're launching their Kickstarter. Um, 
making assets for the Kickstarter, including videos, uh, banner images, all sort of, you know, all those individual bits and pieces do cost money. It's an additional fee that we don't have money for. So there's a lot that goes into that. And going back into planning for one step forward, we didn't really have a set plan. We wanted the idea of a Kickstarter to help us move forward, to help cover some of the costs and try and get people paid. But it was an additional series of steps that we needed to do that were more difficult than we were ready for. Um, even now, our studio doesn't have a significant media presence either. And that's something that in order to make a Kickstarter successful, you need to be prepared. You need to be posting on Twitter and Lemosoft in our case, uh, Instagram, YouTube, even Twitch. Meeting up with people and getting a presence there is not, it's not optional. And for us, Wolf and I at least, we couldn't go into debt doing that there was no way for us to actually reasonably pay back the debt. I work at a Walgreens. He doesn't work at all. He's a student. Um, so there, we don't have any method to actually pay back the fees that, or any of the costs that we incur. So that puts us at in significant jeopardy if we do decide to go into debt on a game that realistically will probably do modestly well, but is almost certainly not going to be a huge success financially or Otherwise, both. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I forgot, <laughs> talk, I forgot push talk is not a thing here. Um, so, killing the project. Ultimately, I need to stop saying that. Um, when we went and thought about killing the project, we actually had tried about a year into development. Um, I gave the studio a soft kill switch. And what that is for us is the studio needs to complete a certain amount of assets by a certain amount of time. And if they fail this, then the project will be cut and we'll be moving on. Uh, the thing that we didn't account for is that people got, you know, on, got off their asses, did the work. And then once that kill switch was passed, production dropped immediately. And anyone that is working a project that plan that needs to ultimately use this strategy needs to know that productivity will drop after people have passed these deadlines. So you need to keep up the pressure and make sure that the game is fun enough for people to develop in the first place. Another issue we had was attrition. With the multiple reworks and the long dev time, and having to hire new members uh, to take up old roles. It meant that people were working on a project that wasn't initially theirs or people working on a project that had taken two years and that weighs heavily on everyone working on it. So when you hit that two year mark and you're, you have say like 40,000 words written, you have to decide, are you going to shove this shit through production or are you going to move on and it was healthier for us to move on as a lot of the writers in particular no longer enjoyed writing the story and we were not producing high quality writing like we have in the past so when it was broached to the studio should we bench this project and move on and try to learn from the situation and have our next project be more successful. We had a meeting about it and the meeting was immediately not whether or not we should kill the project. It was what do we do now that we are killing it with the meeting. It was already a foregone conclusion in people's minds that the second the question was asked, the project was going to die and people are okay with that. So sometimes projects, Killing a project won't cause people to be as upset as you think they will be, especially if they get to move on to their own IP that we're working on as a studio. And our plans on moving forward from this experience is uh, one, continue all of our game jam games, but ensure that we're only doing one a year and uh, make sure that it stays within that month 
So Nana Reno should not extend afterwards or beforehand. Keep it all that month. We want to uh, downsize the scope of our next game and set a very hard deadline of a certain amount of time so we can get that experience of a, a game outside of a game jam uh, and learn, you know, implement the fixes to our mistakes and make sure that before we work on any large scale projects again, that we can follow through on the things we've learned. We're also going to take a couple months of dev time off from development to specifically retrain people and to reteach fundamentals as brain drain is a very real thing for volunteer studios. And if you don't approach brain drain and reteach people who are new or ensure that the directors know what they're doing, because not everyone has been a director for a billion years, you always want to teach anyone that's new and ensure that you're not throwing in the wolves. <laughs> and from there, we will be moving on to finally working on our uh, flagship game that we've been waiting for years to do. And the good aspect of this, other than the fact that we get to move on and do another game, is that we built this project so it wouldn't sink the studio and that we could specifically learn from it. We went into it expecting a learning experience. And even if it was ultimately dropped, we have a long laundry list of things that we can fix in order to ensure our next project succeeds. The learning experience we got. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Okay, so Q&A. Let me see if I can actually switch applications here because I am trying very hard to see what Discord looks like. Come on. Hi. Well, all right, we have time for maybe one question while I hand it off to Rukia. Rip. You guys have any questions? We kind of the whole chat kind of went off the rails into like Kickstarter goods land. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say Kickstarter is actually really expensive if you're um, if you're going to be doing a lot of physicals. My rule of thumb for that was basically if we're gonna have physicals, they're gonna be limited and they're going to be expensive. Um, so I think the idea was probably no more than fifteen physical slots. We don't benefit from scale, but if we say ten two hundred and fifty dollar, or actually I think it was ten hundred and fifty, and then five two hundred and fifty backer rolls, you would get something, but it wouldn't break the bank for us to ship because we can send it all at once, and there wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't actually cost more than we'd be getting in terms of Kickstarter funds. Uh, most of our items probably would have been digital the question was can you say that we reached a milestone uh no I think maybe that was a meme that was a meme the, the question i think katie should be answered first yeah. without physicals would you say kickstarter would be easier yes so i mean it's still going to be really difficult but it reduces the ends time you know it reduces the additional work you have to do after the kickstarter um it also does reduce some of the work you have to do beforehand, uh, researching what kind of physical merge we could make and how much that would cost, how much it would cost to print like a physical art book or buttons or lanyards, shirts, mugs, whatever. That is definitely something that would have been a significant drain on my time personally. Uh, question was, do you have a recommendation on what part should be done first. Is that, do we have time for that? Uh, Question? I think you guys can uh, I'm it. typing. Yeah. I, I'm typing that answer right now. I think we could just type from now on and we can move on. All right. 